Hello there! In this video, we're going to look at the new PC I have built just for editing videos, because my previous one was a bit slow. This is a list of all the various parts used to build this beast, and as I'm using it to do this video, I can tell you it's worked out just as I'd hoped. This whole build was planned to be as cheap to put together as possible, but as you can see, I haven't skimped on the parts. Let's start with the power supply. Those of you who've been building PCs for a while might recognise this as an older part. This is a Corsair 750HX Professional Power Supply. It carries an 80 plus silver rating, but it's efficient enough to hit gold standard with reviews rating it up to a 93% efficiency. And it's from 2009. Next is the CPU. A Ryzen 7 3700X. It was released in 2019 and its 8 cores are still among the best you can get in the CPU to date. My bulk storage drive is this 2015 Toshiba P300 3TB hard drive. It's ideal for storing all of those 4K explosion transparencies I'll never use. Oh, and Steam games of course. Two 16 gig kits of 3200MHz Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 memory. It's seven years old, having been released in 2015, but it's still great today. The boot disk I'll be using is this Sabrent Rocket NVMe drive. It's only 256 gig, but it's for Windows and application installation, so it doesn't need to be huge. It's the same age as the CPU, released in 2019. The motherboard is another 2019 part, an MSI B450M Pro VDH Max. Nothing special here, but good reviews across the board and pretty cheap to buy. To keep the processor cool, I've chosen the Noctua U14S. This is a fantastic cooler, pun intended, and is overkill for this CPU, which it keeps at around 30 degrees when idle, even though it came out in 2013. The last main part is the case. It's one of the oldest parts, coming from back in 2014, but still retails at over £100 eight years later. That should tell you how good it is. You can fit up to 1020mm case fans, or two water cooling radiators if you'd prefer. There's masses of space for storage, a power supply shroud, built-in fan controller, and very generous cable management space behind the motherboard tray. OK, let's start building. first thing to do is put together the motherboard connecting parts. If you haven't done this before, think of it as more expensive Lego. Or Meccano, if you're older. After getting the motherboard out onto its anti-static bag, it's time to fit the CPU into the socket. If you build a PC using a CPU like this one, it's a good idea to check the pins to make sure none are bent before trying to fit it. If some are bent, you can gently persuade them back using tweezers or fine pliers, but be really, really careful. The last thing you want to do is snap off an important pin. The orientation of the CPU into the socket is important to get right. With this processor, the pins in one corner are different to the rest, so match the orientation of that corner with the socket corner that has the same amount of holes. Line it up gently and it should just drop into place. Then make sure it isn't sitting loose in the socket and push down the clamping arm. This moves a layer in the socket that clamps onto the pins, keeping it in place. Next thing to do is to clean off all the nasty finger grease you just got over your nice new, or nearly new, processor. I keep a bottle of isopropyl alcohol around for cleaning up electronic parts. I use it to make sure connecting component interface pins are nice and clean too, so I can be sure of a proper connection. Make sure to scrub the whole surface of your CPU. You want it to be as free of dirt as possible when putting your cooler on it. It just evaporates off, so it doesn't matter if you use too much. But as you can see here, a little goes a long way. Hmm. 
See, it all evaporates off, so no need to go wiping things up with a cloth. Oh, and remember to put the lid back on. I haven't yet, as I still need it. Next, we need to prepare the cooler. This one comes with a nice big 140mm fan, but it's been cunningly made so it can be mounted as a 120mm fan. This was an eBay buy as well. So let's see what was put in the box of mounting parts. It must have been used on an Intel CPU before as the AMD bag is still in one piece. Bits and bobs and brackets. And a useful screwdriver. Let's clean the bottom of the cooler as it looks a bit dull. Again, this will be making almost direct contact with your CPU, so you want it nice and clean for the best thermal transfer to its heat pipes. Bit of polish with a cotton makeup pad. And a wonderfully shiny almost mirror finish. Next thing to do is find all the brackets required to mount this to the motherboard. This part and its pair are of no use. They are to fit this cooler onto the previous generation of AMD socket, being AM3. This is an AM4 socket motherboard. If in doubt, Google the part numbers to see what they're for. It looks as though there's actually very little in this box of mounting parts that I can actually use. I should have checked with the seller what mounting kit was included. Having cobbled together some bracket parts that will be of actual use, it's time to prep the motherboard for mounting the cooler. Here we can see the motherboard backplate. This is what you'll be bolting the cooler mounting kit into, so it's good it's there or there'd be no way to anchor the cooler in place. Ah, another bag of bits. These are for mounting to an Intel motherboard though, so not of much use. We don't need these black plastic mounting blocks. If you were to buy a less complicated cooler, you would just clip it directly onto those little hooks sticking out of the middle of each block. But I got an overkill cooler that requires more work, so off they come. Having found an assortment of parts that will go together to mount this cooler on this board, it's time to fit the spacers. These are going to have the bracket the cooler connects to sitting on top of them, so they need to be the right height. Now on go the bracket and bolts that go through to the back plate.
nice and tight, but not too tight. Now that we're ready to fit the cooler, we need an interface material to go between the CPU top and the bottom of the cooler. This is commonly known as thermal paste. It fills in all the tiny nooks and imperfections between the CPU and cooler to act as a heat transfer medium. There are many suggested methods of applying this. Some do an X or a P-sized blob in the middle in the hopes that it'll spread out and cover all of the surface area. Me? I like to actually cover the area in a thin layer. That way I know it's going to be between all of the cooler and processor connecting plates. Most of these pastes are not electrically conductive, so no need to worry about it splurging down onto electrical components once the whole thing is put together. It doesn't need to be perfect, as once the cooler is clamped down it'll even out with the pressure of mounting it. Don't forget to clean your tools as you go, and wipe off any excess globs if you paste like me, just to be tidy. Now to mount the cooler. Now those of you who've done this before are probably thinking, why the hell is he mounting it that way? Well that's down to the mounting kit I had in the box unfortunately. Ideally you're meant to have your airflow in your case set up so you have an intake fan at the front and possibly the bottom of the case. This then directs cool air over your hot components and is then exhausted out of the back of the case. Unfortunately this wasn't the case here. I only had Intel and older AMD parts to use, but luckily I found a combination that allowed the cooler to be mounted. It just goes to show you should check your second-hand purchases before going to fit them, which I obviously didn't do. Since I filmed these sections, the appropriate AM4 kit came through the post, allowing me to mount the cooler again in the front-to-back airflow position. I'm alternately tightening each mounting screw a bit at a time so as not to put undue pressure on one side when tightening. Back in the day, uneven pressure of your cooler onto your CPU was a surefire way to crack the processor, but these days it probably isn't so much of an issue. So, as said, the airflow will be going that way, which when mounted in the PC case means it'll be blowing towards the top of the case. Now I've attached the fiddly clips onto the fan, it can now be connected onto the cooler. The clips just use tension to grip onto the side of the cooler, fitting through the various heat dissipating metal fins and clipping behind the ridge. Well, that seems good and secure. Now that is out of the way, let's fit the memory. Memory modules only go in one way. There's a cutout part way along the connections that corresponds to a ridge in the socket they go into, so what I'm doing now is comparing the memory to the ridge to make sure it's the right way around before fitting. It slots into one socket end clip and the other is a push-down clip, which makes a satisfying crunch when plugged in fully. 
There it is. I'm also only fitting one kit of two modules in case the whole thing goes bang when I start it up. Next is to fit the boot disk for installing Windows. This motherboard has a little socket you can plug an M.2 drive into. And then all you need is to put the screw in at the other end to keep it in place. Now I'm just looking it over to see if I missed anything. Nope! Now we can fit it into the case. Motherboards come with an I.O. or input-output shield that fits around the sockets on the back to stop dust getting in. You may find if you buy a motherboard from eBay that it does not include this shield. They're not absolutely necessary, but they do make the finished build look nicer. The shield goes in before the motherboard. It can be a bit of a faff getting it in, but it is meant to be a tight fit. Next, we position the motherboard to fit to the shield. Make sure that the holes dotted around the motherboard line up with the raised screw post that it sits on top of. That thunk noise was it sitting in place on the posts. Then you have to screw the motherboard down onto those raised posts it's sitting on. For this, I'm using a screwdriver which has interchangeable tips and all magnetic. You can imagine how fiddly this might be otherwise, especially if you drop one. Yes, I know I missed some at the bottom, but I was going to do this as a test fit so I wasn't too fussed about getting all the screws in. Six is fine. Now what I'm doing is plugging the CPU cooler fan into the three pin connector on the motherboard which gives it its power. I should really have done that before installing the memory to make things easier for myself. Now that's all in, we're around the back with dangling cables. The USB 3 connector, the front panel audio port connector labelled HD Audio, a USB 2 connector, and a mess of tiny connectors which go into the power switch and activity LED, the hard drive activity light, and there is the reset switch. All of these need to be fed through from the back through the rubber grommet holes to roughly where they plug in on your motherboard. First, I'm fitting in the USB 3 connector. It's quite a tight fit, hence the wiggling. Now to connect the USB port. It has a blocked off hole that corresponds to a missing pin on the motherboard interface, so it's easy to identify which way round it goes. The audio port connector is going to be connected to this sound card. The card needs one of these brackets at the back to be removed before it will slot into place though. Now I can plug it into an empty card slot on the motherboard and screw it back down and secure it in place.
Now to fit the power supply. It screws in at the back in four spots to keep it locked in place and in this case it sits on six rubber pads to neutralise any vibration from the fan rotation. This cable is the CPU power cable and that is where it will plug. I'll just feed it through quickly and move on to the other cable. This one plugs in here, or at least it will in a bit after speeding up some more cable tidying. I think I'll put it through the top rubberized hole. There we go. This cable provides power to all of the motherboard systems. And here I go plugging in the extra 8-pin CPU power cable I fed through earlier. Now we have the power sorted out, it's time to add the last major part which I've missed out so far, the graphics card. This is another quite old part having been built in 2016. I was very lucky in that a friend from work had a PC in her cupboard that didn't start properly and she asked if I wanted it. I had no idea what was in it but picked it up and found this inside. It's a Gigabyte branded NVIDIA GTX 1060 with 6 gigabytes of memory and as you can see it takes up two slots from the back of the case. With the current scalpocalypse in full swing Getting a decent graphics card can be an expensive proposition, so I was incredibly grateful for this. The rest of her PC turned into my new media centre PC. This card also requires power, and I have some cables I've never used from my other identical power supply, so I know they'll fit and be compatible. Never mix removable cables from one power supply to another. Different manufacturers have different capacitors in the cable lines and other differences that make mixing your modular cables very dangerous. Nice and simple to fit, the black end goes into the graphics card and the blue end into the labelled blue socket on the power supply. Now everything necessary is plugged in and has power, let's connect it to the monitor and see if anything shows on screen. Don't forget to plug in your power cable at this point. OK, moment of truth. Let's press the power button and see if all the parts I bought work. Lights showing on the side of the graphics card is a good sign. That tells me at least that isn't dead. Come on, give me a sign of life. At this point, with it all being second hand, the motherboard or processor might be dead. You only have the seller's word that it worked, so it's a bit of a lottery and a lot of trust. Come on, something should be showing. Did I waste a whole bunch of cash? <laughs> the thing! It's telling me I put the memory in the wrong slots. This is great because it tells me that the motherboard and memory are talking to each other and the CPU is feeding that data through to the graphics card which then displays it on screen. <sighs> okay, 
let's try installing Windows 10 from a USB stick I prepared earlier. Because I recorded this process using what is now my old editing machine, we can record how long it takes. Right, the USB stick is loading the Windows installation files. I'm going to speed this up as otherwise it could make for rather tedious watching, but keep an eye on the elapsed time at the top to see just how long this machine takes to install Windows. I normally find it takes 10 to 15 minutes installing from USB, but as you can see from this sped up recording, Windows 10 installed from installation launch to entering the desktop in less than six minutes. I installed Cinebench to see what video rendering juice I was dealing with and thought I'd see just how long it takes this machine to get to the desktop from powered off along the way. Fifteen seconds is pretty darn nippy. I'm very happy with that. Right, let's see how fast it renders the scene in Cinebench R23. Buying a PC at the moment is a very pricey prospect. What with the ongoing silicon shortage and scalpers buying all the new graphics cards, and if you were to look on Amazon at the moment, you can expect the top-end PCs to go for up to £4,000, which is absolutely ridiculous. Now, I'm no stranger to building PCs, and in the past have bought all my parts new from known sites like eBuyer, Dabs or Scan. This build process was a bit of a leap of faith, an experiment in buying second-hand parts to build a PC, and if I can do it, then so can you. It doesn't take any special know-how or skill to build a PC yourself, and there's nothing to be scared of. There are plenty of build videos like this on YouTube that are easy to find. Practice by dismantling and reassembling a PC nobody uses, perhaps? Somebody in your neighbourhood is likely to have an old junk PC they don't want. Anyway, Cinebench completed in 1 minute and 5 seconds with a resulting score of 12,134. I don't know how good that is, so let's compare it to my old machine. Wow! My new machine is 3.33 times faster than my old one. Let's see how much this trebled performance cost, shall we? Well, according to Part Picker, the cheapest I can buy all those parts for new would total £882. That isn't including the graphics card. So the buy it new cost would have been £882. But how much did it cost me? My total spend was £476.21. But what about the graphics card? That wasn't on the part picker list. No, you're absolutely right. If I were to have bought that card, it would have cost me about £192.25. That's the average of the last 10 cards of this model sold most recently on eBay. If I factor that into my pricing, that would make the buy at new price of this PC £1,074.67. Let's work out the percentages on that. £475.48 is 44.3% of the cost of buying these parts new. That's staggering. That means getting all these parts on eBay, Facebook Marketplace and from my workmates saved me nearly £600. I could have built two for the price of one. So there we have it. Not the best build video I could have made, but it was more about the destination than the journey for me. And now you know how much you can save if you buy second hand. Like me, you can pay in installments using PayPal so you don't get hit all at once, and wait for voucher codes before you buy your parts. Don't forget your Facebook Marketplace either. I just got my son a 3DS XL and two Pokemon games for £50 for his birthday.
They sell for over £100 on eBay without games, so that was a bargain and a half. Also, ask your friends and family. You never know what they might have buried in a cupboard. Well, I think this about wraps this up. I'll see you in the next one. Stay safe!